I'm going to Louisiana. I'm gonna get me a mojo hand. I'm going to Louisiana. I'm gonna get me a mojo hand. I didn't want to fix my woman so she can't have no other man. Cold ground on my bed last night. Rocks on my pillow too. Cold ground on my bed last night. Rocks on my pillow too. You know I woke this morning wondering what in the world am I gonna do? Down thing, thinking about a mojo. If you see my baby lying standing around, you know it. Some wild baby like mama, shake them all down, Lord, in my solo.
Hello and welcome to the 2021 Arhuli Awards Celebration. I'm Charlie Musselwhite, coming to you from the Shack Up Inn in Clarksdale, Mississippi. I was born in Mississippi and I grew up not too far from here in Memphis, Tennessee. After many years in Chicago and hanging around learning from guys like Muddy Waters and Big Walter and Big Joe Williams and Little Walter and other heroes of mine, I made my way out to California where Chris Rockwitz was nice enough to hire me to work in the R. Hooley Records warehouse. I even cut a couple of records for Chris, so it's a personal pleasure for me to be here. We've got a great program for you tonight, a combination of archival film from the R. Hooley Foundation vault and new performances by a range of artists inspired by the old stuff, many of them quite young, demonstrating again that the story of down-home American music is not only of the past, it continues on right now in the present. We're here to honor a few of the people who have kept that lamp trimmed and burning, the 2021 R. Hooley Award honorees. But what are these awards all about? The R. Hooley Awards are annual prizes presented by the R. Hooley Foundation created to recognize and offer a little financial support to musicians, teachers, organizations, and others doing their part to help keep tradition-based music alive and well. We will be introducing you to this year's winners throughout the program, and along the way, we'll explore some of the traditions and history they represent. Let's kick things off with a look at some of the folks who may not have grown up in a hollow log, but have taken great inspiration from traditional music and the people who made it. 10 years ago, our Hooli Records celebrated its 50th anniversary with three days of concerts at the Freight and Salvage Coffee House in Berkeley, California. Among the highlights was a surprise guest appearance by singer Maria Muldar, sitting in on a gutsy, rendition of Memphis Minnie's 1941 classic, In My Girlish Days. We're gonna do a song uh, by Memphis Minnie about her youthful escapades, but they could just as easily have been written about my youthful escapades <laughs> or any brought in this joint. <laughs> it's called In My Girlish Days. Train didn't have a 
dime I was trying to run away from that old home of mine But I didn't know no better Oh boy, is it my girlish day But now my friends are real surprised I had to travel before I got wise Now I know better And I still got all my girlish ways Oh yeah, I'll play the blues Thank you. Maria Muldaur. Thank you. Long live Memphis Mini. All right. That was Maria Muldaur with Susie Thompson on fiddle, Laurie Lewis on upright bass, and Eric Thompson on guitar, tapping into the gritty spirit of the great Memphis Mini. I was a big fan of Memphis Mini's records, too. I never really got to talk to her, but I did see her one time when Furry Lewis took me over to her house, and there she was sitting on this porch, and she was asleep. And we decided not to wake her up. And I thought we'd come back sometime, but I never did. Now to Brooklyn, New York, where a small storefront venue and music school is at the heart of a thriving traditional music scene and an outstanding annual folk festival. It's time for our first Arhuli Award of the Night. The Jalopy Theater is a venue in Red Hook, Brooklyn, one of the finest in the city of New York, dedicated to the service and presentation of the greatest of folk musics from various cultures. Jalopy promotes and preserves uh, musical traditions uh, from the Americas, but also from all over the world. And um, through performances, but also through education, through teaching, and through other types of activities that really do bring the community together to get to know these musical traditions and to learn them um, practically as well. We provide music education, both for adults and children. We focus on teaching in community. So our classes are group classes where people are sharing and learning together. We, uh, we do live music six nights a week, and we also have family programming every Sunday. Ever since my family has been coming here, my kid has been doing the string band program for a number of years, and he loves it. He always wants to come back every year, and I think it's a combination of um, he really enjoys playing the music. He loves learning the songs. I think he likes the approach that they take to teaching music. Uh, but honestly, I think a big part of it is that I think he feels like he's part of a community of kids who love music here. They have a really good time together. They have a lot of laughs. They joke around. Um, they really get to kind of breathe and have a spacious time enjoying the music that I think is pretty unique in music programs. It's really been a place that's always been welcoming. Uh, we always feel like we're among friends here. Uh, audiences here really listen, really are interested. So it's really a place for any musician, any dancer, any artist to feel like their work is being appreciated. It was one of the most welcoming places I could find as a young musician and a place to get established. I don't know how good I was at, back in those days, but the folks treated me like I was royalty back then, and I've been coming ever since. The Jalopy Theater presents a number of public offerings, things that happen outside of the, outside of the theater space. The largest one is the Brooklyn Folk Festival every spring. Uh, so every year we bring in musicians um, not only from New York City, but from the, the, from Appalachia, from the Deep South, from out West, um, and even from other countries. And in this way, it serves a very important function in maintaining a, a community and a world of music that exists in a very grassroots way um, all over, all over the place. 
and we all know each other and keep in touch and the Brooklyn Folk Festival as well when we all come together and create something that's I think really special and, and unique. We are the, the Jalopy Theater and School of Music and we are thrilled to have received, received the 2021 our early, early award. award. Congratulations to Jeff and Lynette Wiley, Eli Smith, and all the teachers, students, musicians, and fans who make the Jalopy Theater what it is. Let's take a look inside the theater now, where banjo player and singer Nora Brown has taken the stage. At 16, she's already a key figure in the newest generation of young musicians taking up the mantle of the old time music. All right, here's a little bit of Coal Creek March. This is a tune, this version I got from Roscoe Halcom. Uh, and this is appropriate because I'm playing this banjo here, a very special banjo that was owned by John Cohen. And um, John was a good friend of mine uh, who was very talented in a lot of artistic careers, but um, most well known from uh, his band, New Lost City Ramblers, who often traveled with other musicians um, from Appalachia and Eastern Kentucky, Roscoe specifically. Um, and when Roscoe would tour around with them, he would often play this banjo, um, and he also recorded a little bit on it. So it's very cool. It's on its way to the Library of Congress. Um, and yeah, it's just really exciting to play it. So I'm gonna play this tune, which um, got from his playing. Here's a little of that Coal Creek March. The next Arhuli Award recipient isn't exactly just starting out. He's been around a long time to have turned down a drink from Hank Williams. First, let's take a look at some California country royalty. Woody Guthrie called the Maddox Brothers and Rose the best hill country string band in these 48 states of ours. The power in their music and singing, he wrote, is older and stronger than any known or unknown form of atomic energy. A poor sharecropping family from Alabama, the Maddoxes set out for California in 1933 when Rose and her four brothers were still children. They found work in the fruit orchards near Modesto and sang around campfires in the hobo jungles where they lived. By the mid-1940s and into the 50s, the Maddox brothers and Rose had blossomed into one of the biggest names and attractions in California country music, and Rose herself into one of the great pioneer women voices of country music history, period. Here she is on stage in 1990. It's not her brothers behind her, but it's a fine country band made up of her grandson, Donnie Maddox, on bass, guitar, and harmony vocals, Bob Alecno on guitar, Joe Goldmark on pedal steel, Kevin Wimmer on fiddle, and Sam Siggins on drums. 
Turns out they had never played together before. It sure doesn't sound like it. A spirited force, Rose Maddox, there with Jimmy Rogers' Mule Skinner Blues. There's a new powerful female voice in country music rising up right now in Oakland, California. Miko Marks has been around a little while, but it hadn't been easy for her to break into country music. Still struggling to break the mold. Not too many black women have found success as country singers. Her first album in 12 years, our country challenges stylistic boundaries and carries with it, in her words, a message of unity and outspokenness for black musicians and country music and beyond. Here they are with Move It On Over by Hank Williams. But you can bet Miko takes her inspiration from the Rose Maddox version.
Thank you, Miko. Let's learn a little bit more about the extraordinary career of steel guitar master Bobby Black, our next Arhuli Award honoree. He's been playing for over 70 years and has very few, if any, equals. When Bobby Black was a teenager, he had no idea how to tune his lap steel. So he wrote a fan letter to steel guitar giant Jerry Bird at the Grand Ole Opry, asking him how he did it. Bird answered right away with his tunings, and Bobby taught himself from there, kicking off a musical journey that continues today. Bobby and his brother Larry practiced together at home, eventually getting hired on with the Double H Boys for the Hoffman Hayride Radio Show. When Bobby was 18, he met Hank Williams in the Tracy Gardens in San Jose. Hank invited the brothers to a bar next door. Hank said, hey boys, come over here. and I just wrote this tune, do you think it's any good? And he played Kalija. And I guess they, they said, yeah, I think, it, I think it's okay. <laughs> in 1952, Bobby was still a teenager when he hit the road to join Blackie Crawford and his Western Cherokees in Oklahoma in Beaumont, Texas, where he honed his chops as part of the house band at Neva's Club and appeared on a couple of popular recordings on the fledgling Star Day label. But it was back in San Jose that Bobby met Bill Kirchin, the lead guitarist for the Commander Cody and the Lost Planet Airmen Band, who invited him to join their touring band. I'd heard the Cody Band before Bobby was part of it, where their original steel player, the uh, West Virginia Creeper, as he was known, you know, he was a good player. But when Bobby joined the band, it was a whole other universe, really. He's such a master and had already been doing it for, you know, 20 years at that point. Bobby's professionalism and experience helped to tighten up the band. He was with them for several years, followed by stints with Asleep at the Wheel and the New Riders of the Purple Sage. All along, Bobby continued to play on the West Coast with his brother, whether it be country, Hawaiian, or cool jazz, continuing the musical partnership that started in their bedroom back home. It's a relatively new instrument that was invented by these guys, and they kind of invented how to play it. So there's a real unique area of his, you can tell Bobby Black when you hear him, more so than almost any other instrument, I think. It's a very personalized thing. I mean, he's interested in all kinds of music, especially Hawaiian, but as we all know, he's played rock, and he's played all kinds of different country music. So he, he has a little broader background and interest than I think a lot of pedal steel players do. I learned to really get into the music, that sort of thing that I wouldn't have done ordinarily. I would have probably stayed and kept playing, you know, uh, you know the country cut type of stuff, you know, the, and, and the swing too. I mean, I love it all. I just like, I love it all. I really do. What stands out in all these settings is his command of the pedal steel. He is one of the last of a generation who discovered the instrument and made it their own. Bobby's playing has attracted a wide cross-section of fans who appreciate the experience, tone, and sound he brings anytime he is playing. Bobby, you can tell from these early records, he's got a tremendous ear. He can hear it. It's not enough to just understand it intellectually. You have to really be able to, to get it under your fingertips, as we say. You have to really hear it and feel it. You know, you just, it's not an intellectual thing. He's always, you know, his tone is always great but I think the most important thing is his taste. I mean, he's a master of the instrument, but there are people who are virtuosos who play all over singers, you know, so that it gets in the way, and he's always supremely tasteful, always doing exactly the right thing. It's just music, you, you know? It's a, music is a language. It's a, you, you always, that's the old saying about the you know, universal language, you know? So what do you get? Different styles, it's, it's, but you add, add it to your repertoire, your ability, you know, anyway. So that's how I look at, look at it. I've always, you know, I've discovered that along the way. I thought, I'm going to start playing something else like that pretty soon. It's like, yay, it's pretty, it's fun to play this too, you know, kind of thing. He and his brother were making this fantastic music in the first part of the 1950s. 
when they were, you know, they were just teenagers. Or Bobby was maybe around 20 and, you know, so they, they were both what you would call child prodigies these days and just came out of the gate as teenagers playing some of the best, you know, country and swing music that there is, really. Bobby is a wonderful human being and everyone who meets him is just is utterly charmed by him. He's a very, very gentle and sensitive person, very modest about his own talents. And, and some people call him the Buddha of the pedal steel because he's just, he's so calm and always smiling and, and wonderful. Join us congratulating Bobby Black on winning the 2021 Arhuli Award. I'd like to thank the entire Arhuli Foundation for bestowing upon me this great honor. And uh, I'd also like to send some special thanks to Laurie Lewis for nominating me. And, uh, you know, music has always been a part of my life, and it's gratifying to be recognized this way and to be appreciated for whatever small contributions I was ever, ever made, you know, able to make to the industry. And I'm grateful to everyone who has supported me through this musical journey of mine. And I'll treasure this award for the rest of my days. Let's turn now to another kind of music featuring steel guitar, the gospel tradition known as Sacred Steel. Sacred Steel is high-powered praise music centered around the wail and cry of pedal and lap steel guitar. It comes out of the House of God Holiness Pentecostal Church, where it remained for decades until the early 1990s when with the help of folklorist Bob Stone and Chris Strockwitz of Arhuli, it started making its way into the world at large. Musician and band leader Alvin Lee came up immersed in steel guitar music at the House of God Church in Perrine, Florida, where his father was pastor. He and his brothers held down the church band, and House of God Perrine came to be known within the greater church for its musical excellence and innovation. Alvin played guitar and bass, his brother Glenn Lee was one of the most influential pedal steel players in the state of Florida. When Glenn died in 2000 at the age of 32, Alvin reformed the band and took it out of the church and onto the road as the Lee Boys. And they've been going ever since. We are thrilled to have Alvin here with us now, recorded live in Houston, Texas, with 30-year-old pedal steel player Dontrell Wright who also grew up in House of God, and who takes Glenn Lee to be his role model on steel.
right. Man. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Chop. That was Alvin Lee and Don Trill Wright with the Sonny Treadway zinger, Don't Let the Devil Ride, followed straight away by a gorgeous and understated Amazing Grace, performed by the Campbell Brothers in 2011 at the Freight and Salvage in Berkeley, featuring the late Derek Campbell on steel. The guy on pedal steel, Chuck Campbell, is our next Arhuli Award recipient an innovator on his instrument, a leader in his greater musical community, and a mentor to many. Chuck has done as much as anyone to carry on and even grow the sacred steel tradition. Let's take a closer look at 2021 our Huli Award honoree, Chuck Campbell. In our church, the steel guitar was the lead instrument. And I first heard the steel guitar that I can remember was probably when I was um, maybe three or four, and it was the prettiest sound I've ever heard. The tradition started off really just from our perspective on the lap steel. You know, they started off on the six string and then it moved up to like the 10 string. Then from there it started with the pedal steel and Chuck was a big influence on that transition. I asked my father to buy me a pedal steel. And of course he was like, oh, I don't know what you need with a pedal steel. Nobody plays that in our church. It was a chance encounter with pedal steel master and steel guitar hall of famer, Jimmy Day, that changed his father's tune. What really made me want to do pedal steel is we have our national convention in Nashville every year and what happened was we we decided to um, go by Showbud shop Jackson shop and in the shop was Jimmy Day he was just tuning up and pressing the pedals and I, I never heard nothing like this 
he had a wine bottle there. And, he, and my father said, could you play something? He just started playing Amazing Grace while he was drinking the wine bottle without the bar. And, and my father and I looked at each other. We was like, oh, no, no. And it was so pretty the way he was playing. And he just drank a little bit and played without and drank a little bit. And, and put, I don't know if this was showmanship or what it was. But the only thing I know is, after he did that, I had to have a pedal steel guitar. His new instrument opened up worlds of sonic possibility. But with all its pedals and levers and potential tunings, it took something of a mechanic to get it working just the way you wanted. The pedal steel allows you to uh, program the knee levers and the pedals and different where you go up, go up or down, two or three semitones and at a time. The only problem is you have to go through so much to change the pedals that it could take you uh, anywhere from a whole day to weeks to get it back together and before you find out the results. Chuck's mechanical talent stood out from early on. In fact, he was just 15 years old when his hero, Calvin Cook, invited him to set up the tuning on his pedal steel. The first time I heard him play the setup in church was in, from a tape in Nashville, and I couldn't believe what he was doing with it. By Calvin asking me to set up his steel and then putting it out, putting the word out that I did it, I became the guru, and I was, I was a prodigy. It was just, I understood what I was doing and it, I, you know, and it was just came natural. So it was definitely a gift from God. Calvin Cook and most of the guys in the church still use Chuck's setup today. And Chuck also brought innovations and style to the music, introducing complex chords and modern techniques that his tuning made possible. was used to the just the regular single pedal um, lap still but Chuck introduced introduce all that fast picking um, all those different type of chords to us and that's really was you know turned us on to Chuck. I was accused of you know trying to make rock and roll or doing rock in the church when it was just it's the same notes but you know you put a little distortion or uh, effects on it, flanging and things of that nature, and you're doing the pedals and you're doing the speed, and people automatically say, hey, whoa, 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 that's, that's not church music anymore. Well, Chuck has always been an innovator, and he's always been um, someone that helped others out, the younger uh, guys coming up. I've been mentored and always felt an obligation to mentor others. Some people took it as once God gave me something that that was mine and it wasn't for me to share it with anybody else. I had mentors that said, well, if I share it with you, then it lives on and it grows. The Campbell brothers were among the first groups to take sacred steel music outside of the church and into the world at large. Over the years, they've played festival stages and concert halls from Newport to Shanghai, opening a path for others to do the same. Chuck um, has been a very big influence um, um, with helping us other ones that decided to take the music out of the four walls. Uh, I remember when I first wanted it after my late brother Glenn died, um, I decided to take the Lee Boys music out and I went to Chuck and Chuck, um, him and his brother, they really helped me out. They showed me the ropes because they had already been, was torn out. So they did that for me, and I know they have made rooms for a lot of other the younger players to come up. So by them playing out, 
Chuck and his brothers, um, that was gave us the opportunity to be able to do the same thing. To see what people have done with what I've shared is just unbelievable to me and I'm really grateful for it. I'm Chuck Campbell and I was just humbled and thrilled to win the 2021 Arhuli Award. This is the 2021 Arhuli Award celebration. If you'd like to support these awards or dive into the foundation's considerable online archive of photos, videos, interviews, and more, visit arhuli.org and please consider making a donation. I did. For a behind the scenes look at an extraordinary archive of Roots music, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube today. There, you'll get a backstage pass to rare photographs, videos, and recordings of your favorite artists from the world of Arhuli and beyond. So what are you waiting for? Visit us online and hit that like button today. I ain't lying. We move now from praise music of the church to songs of the street and cantina. A look of three artists. First, a legend of Chicano music, then a breathtaking sister dueto, and finally a Mexican songster from just across the border who also happens to be our next Arhuli Award honoree. The Mexican American songbook covers all aspects of Chicano life, from love and betrayal to personal identity, to issues of grave injustice. Beloved composer and troubadour Lalo Guerrero touched it all with penetrating directness and often great humor. You can't talk about the history of Mexican-American music, said Chris Strockwitz, without mentioning Lalo Guerrero. Lleno de emociones me encuentro con mi jarana Voy a rendir homenaje a la canción mexicana Voy a rendir homenaje a la canción más galana La canción más primorosa que la canción mexicana Para hacer pesos de montones no es como el americano Creo que sí a conquistar corazones no hay mejor que un mexicano ¿Cómo es que él lo consigue sino cantando canciones como ese cielito lindo que alegra los corazones Es la canción mexicana la que se merece honor De ser la más primorosa y alimento en el amor Hay canciones extranjeras que alborotan la pasión Ni una se compara con esta bella canción Señorita quisiera ser mi novia Si Adelita fuera mi mujer Para llevarla a bailar al cuarto. Gracias. Lalo Guerrero. That was Lalo Guerrero singing his composition La Canción Mexicana, made famous by the great Mexican ranchero singer. Lucha Reyes in 1941. Behind him were Los Gavilanes de Oakland, one of the best mariachis of the San Francisco Bay Area, and Arhuli recording artist to boot. Now to Oaxaca, Mexico, to meet Emily and Shayla Rosas, a young sister dueto that has drawn millions to their YouTube channel with gorgeous 
close harmony versions of classic rancheras and Mexican folk songs. The videos are sometimes made by their mom at the kitchen table or in the hills around San Marco, California, where they were born and have lived for most of their lives. Recently, they moved back to their ancestral home in Mexico to reclaim their roots and immerse themselves in the musical culture there. Here they are now at home in San Martin, Sabanillo, Oaxaca, with a beautiful interpretation of Tu Conciencia, originally recorded by Dueto Rio Bravo for Columbia Records. Hola, ¿qué tal? Les saluda a sus amigas Dueto Dos Rosas. Les mandamos un saludo a la Fundación Arjuli con muchísimo cariño. Estamos muy felices de presentarles esta canción, Tu Conciencia. By 1971, Chris had long been a fan of Mexican music, but he hadn't recorded any of it for Arjuli. That all changed in a small cantina in Piedras Negras, Mexico, where he caught up with local trio Los Pinguinos del Norte and their remarkable leader, Ruben Castillo Juarez, also known as the Penguin, our next Arjuli Award recipient. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I first met Los Pinguinos, you know, through this friend of mine that I'd met in, in along the border in, actually he lived in Eagle Pass. He took me to this little bar across the river in, in Piedras Negras to hear Los Pinguinos del Norte, and I was totally knocked out. It's the first time I really heard a, a little conjunto that is, you know, that kind of group in a bar where the response was very spontaneous by the audience, you know. And they sang about songs that meant something to the people there. They spoke for their people and it was just a delight. And nobody ever made a live recording of any of this music. I don't think it's ever been done. Chris released a full-length LP of Los Pinguinos later that year. He returned there in 1975 to record them again for his groundbreaking film with Les Blank, Chulas Fronteras. Chulas Fronteras is, was an amazing vehicle in terms of bringing light to him as a musician, as a songster, uh, as a conservationist of the culture that he's, he's representing. Um, and the role that he played in that film fit perfectly because not only is he uh, what I consider a main protagonist in the film, but he's also one of the driving voices behind that musically. And I compare him to kind of Mans Lipscomb, who is this great songster in Texas, you know, who had this amazing repertoire, who never called himself a blues singer. He called himself a songster because they played all kinds of songs. And so do these people, you know, but the most interesting ones are these corridos, which are these narrative ballads, you know, that are of local interest to people. <laughs> I think Songster encapsulates Ruben Castillo perfectly because not only is he singing, uh, his repertoire is so vast. I mean, he's been singing since the age of 14. And in order for you to sort of make a living behind it, you have to not only sing your own compositions, but you also have to incorporate a lot of the uh, what's happening. Decades after their first sessions, Chris returned to Piedras Negras to capture the sound of Ruben and Los Pinguinos once again. And the next year, put out the second Pinguinos Arhuli album, Travadores de la Frontera. A recording I made in, two, in the year 2000 was actually at the end of, the, it was a very cold day outside his house in Piedras Negras. And it was just a perfect recording session. They did the whole album, as I videotaped it, you see, in one non-stop session. <laughs> and they were just perfect. <laughs> One of our most popular videos on our YouTube channel, incidentally, is Los Pinguinos with Ruben uh, Castillo Juarez. And I attribute that to the revolving audience that is still there from the 20s, 20, 30, 40 years ago. 
Ruben continues to sing in the same town where he started over 65 years ago. I think his ability to really, really sing about his surroundings, his ex experiences, and the experiences around his environment are really the, the, the driving force behind his, his skill set. It's, it's just beautiful music. But he's been that good, and his, his joy of playing and singing, I think, comes through. El día 21 de enero. He was singing the same songs since he was 14 because his audience remained the same. He wasn't so much concerned with musically evolving with the times, although he did incorporate a lot of commercial hits in his repertoire, but his main voice was that of, the, of El Pueblo, the public. Let's congratulate Ruben Castillo Juarez on winning the 2021 Arjuli Award. Tonight, we've already recognized two masters of pedal steel guitar, and Bobby Black and Chuck Campbell. Now we'd like to honor another one, one whose love for pedal steel and for music in general has inspired him in this invaluable role as a patron of traditional music. Ed Littlefield comes from a California family that valued music and supported their community. His mother loved opera, but Ed fell hard for the sweet sound of the pedal steel. I was at Stanford and I heard a recording of Ian and Sylvia. Um, and I think the tune was Jinxon Johnson's. And they had a guy named Weldon Myrick playing pedal steel guitar. Whoa, what was that? It's just, I don't know what a pedal steel guitar is, but I am going to learn how to play one of those. And I just knew at that point, I was absolutely born to play this instrument. And there wasn't any doubt at all. And within a few weeks, I was borrowing that guitar and making money with it. He played in bands, worked the circuit, particularly in the Northwest, and you can still find him today behind the steel for Marley's Ghost. He has played with Emmylou Harris, Bob Weir, Mark and Anne Savoy, and many others. And like his love and dedication to pedal steel, Ed has made it a point to invest in traditional music. It was obvious to me that symphony orchestras and operas have lots and lots of philanthropic support, but Traditional old-timey music, not so much. A lot of the people that are my friends, we believe in playing music for fun in our homes. And so that, promoting that concept is something that I'm very much behind. And I don't much care so much about what particular kind of music it is. Uh, there are lots of different flavors uh, that all work, but it's the music you can play in your kitchen, in your living room. It is supported folk arts and kind of what you might kind of call down-home music organizations nationally. I wouldn't be able to name them all, but uh, Festival of American Fiddle Tunes, which happens up in Port Townsend, Washington. Two of Berkeley's crown jewels of uh, cultural venues, which are the Freight and Salvage and also Ashkenaz, 
both owe so much to Ed and in the case of Ashkenaz, actually also to Ed's dad. It goes back generations. He also supports the Berkeley Old Time Music Convention, which is a festival of old time music that happens every September. And he's supported nationally. I know he's supported um, the American Country Dance Society. And I'm sure there are countless others that I'm forgetting at the moment. But his influence on stabilizing these down-home music kind of organizations is unparalleled. A lot of my projects I do come across because I know the people that are involved in the project. Sure. Jay Unger and Molly Mason have run a, an outfit up in upstate New York outside of Woodstock called the Shokin Dance Camp. Uh, there's another one that, that um, I've been supporting called Swamp in the City in New York. I haven't attended, but, but I think the concept's good. Ed's support of traditional music and traditional arts organizations is so important because these kinds of down-home art forms traditionally don't have access to the same kind of funding that your more classical forms or more elite forms of art have. You know, a philosopher teaches you how to lead, lead a good life. What is the good life? You know, and it requires a little thinking, but um, the, you know, playing good music um, and listening to such things is, is part of the good life. And philanthropy is uh, not too much of a price to play to have a warm, cozy little spot in the sunshine. Ed served as the major donor who helped facilitate the transfer of Arhuli Records to the Smithsonian. Coupled with his ongoing support to Arhuli, traditional musicians, and arts organizations, we are honoring him with a special Arhuli Award, patron of the traditional arts. And I would be delighted to be recognized for the Arhuli thing. I have had several friends that have commented on the, my gift to Arhuli to the Smithsonian. That, that the, uh, uh, some people think that might have been the smartest thing I ever did. <laughs> my mom and dad did a wonderful thing teaching my brother and, and my sister and I about, about philanthropy and, and, and how much fun it, it can be. And, and uh, um, you can support all kinds of, of you know, worthy things and, and, and persuade other people, you know, that it might be a good idea to, to do this as well. Congratulations to Ed Littlefield on your 2021 Arhuli Award. And thank you again for all that you do to help keep traditional music going strong. While we're here, why don't we get a good look at Ed's chops on pedal steel. Here's a clip from the vault. Ed sitting in and holding his own with the Savoie Smith Cajun Band at the Great American Music Hall in San Francisco.
Thanks so much. Thanks a lot. If you're at all familiar with the Cajun music of Southwest Louisiana, you've probably run into the Savoies before. So you know Mark and Ann aren't the only musicians in the family. Brothers Joel and Wilson Savoie are making names for themselves as well. Joel is the man behind Valcour Records, a label with his finger on the pulse of what's going on down their way, especially among younger musicians coming up. And Wilson, as leader of the hard-driving Cajun band, the Pine Leaf Boys, who have two albums on our Hooli and a couple on Valcour as well. We asked the Savoy brothers if they could put something together for this show in honor of their friend Ed. We don't think you'll be disappointed. Here with their version of Poor Hobo by the king of Cajun swing, Harry Chokes, or Wilson Savoy on piano and Joel Savoy on, well, everything else. Hey everybody, howdy from Eunice, Louisiana. Uncle Eddie, this one's for you. Thanks for everything that you do. The Poor Hobo. Okay, there we just saw a really nice, good old Cajun tune by Joel and Wilson Savoy. Longtime friends who I'd known ever since they were little bambinos. <laughs> anyway, and now we're going to go to Charlie Musselwhite. We would like to honor Charlie with the Chris Strockwitz Legacy Award. I think I first met Charlie Musselwhite back in the early 60s, it probably was, at the Jazz Record Mart in Chicago. Charlie was born in Mississippi, and you will know that by his accent. He grew up in Memphis after, and there actually met some of the really old timers from the 20s. But by the time he was living in Chicago, he was beginning to learn from the great blues giants of that era. He must have been noticed at Southside Blues Joints as one of the few white dudes, you know, in the club, but usually the only young guy too, the only young person, you know, because by that time blues was already kind of old folks music for much of the black community. But when they heard that this young guy could really play harmonica, they were fascinated and asked that he sit in with us. That's where he got his real up-to-date blues education. 
Not too many guys got that. And I <laughs> think Charlie must be the last one standing. I hope he ain't, but it might be. At least he's still there. Congratulations. Okay, around 1968, he made his way out to California and I happened to hire him to work in the Arhuli warehouse as a packer and transport man who went to the post office and to the shipping docks, you know, for our big Japanese export orders with a van that was oftentimes really loaded down. That was the beginning of the good times in the blues record business. In 71, Charlie's first Arhuli LP actually became the bestseller for Arhuli that year. Musically, he is the real deal, and he's lived that life. It wasn't always easy, but he's been at it a long time now, and his music comes straight from the heart. He has made over 40 albums of his own and appeared on countless others by Tom Waits and Cindy Lauper and Bonnie Raitt and John Lee Hooker, Ben Harper, and other cats, you know, that's just too many to name. And he has been recognized by many over, over the years by the Grammy folks, the Blues Music Awards, and the Blues Hall of Fame, which inducted him in 2010. Congratulations. <laughs> but I will also always personally be grateful to Charlie Musselwhite for introducing me to my dear friend and guide in the world of Mexican music. Because when Les Blanks lead to a Spanish woman here in Berkeley, trying to help me translate the songs I just recorded by Los Pinguinos del Norte down in Piedras Negras, Coahuila, didn't work out at last because he simply said, who are these people? Where are they from? I can't understand the word they're singing. I happened to ask Charlie, do you happen to know anyone who speaks Spanish? And Charlie, in his wonderful Mississippi accent, said, I got just the right man for you. I said, what's his name? And he said, James Nicolopoulos. And I said, come on, a Greek guy fluent in Spanish? And Charlie once again said, in his wonderful accent, you better believe it. <laughs> Congratulations to Charlie Musselwhite on his Arhuli Legacy Award, and cheers to a long and wonderful friendship and for everything I learned from him and through him. Keep on trucking. This award is so important to me because it represents a large part of my life that uh, knowing Chris Rockwitz and being involved with Arhuli and the great music that we all love and music from the heart is what I call it. It's a, uh, you know, not commercial baloney, but real music from real people about real things. And to be a part of this is just beyond words for me to tell you how deeply it, I'm moved and, and I feel like, you know, being involved with this and I did a good thing. And I can look back on my life and just be proud of this. And, it means a lot. I can't thank you enough to Chris and Arhuli. Mm -hmm. This has been a great evening. We've seen some legends of music here tonight. And I think we have seen signs of a bright future too. Thanks for joining us. I thought I'd share a song with you on our way out. Okay, here we go. I was walking down the road Blues gave me a ride Blues tell the truth in a world that's full of lies I was raised 
up in Memphis Down Highway 61 But I live in Clarksdale Where you find me behind the sun Get all your troubles and roll on down the road. Well, now, baby, hear that sound. Hear that howling wind. It feels just like this old, this old world is about to end. I was walking down the road Blues gave me a ride Couldn't get back home no matter how hard I tried This is Deke's Harmonica Emporium Oasis. <laughs> Everything harmonic. This is a picture of Deke and James Cotton and myself in Sugar Blue in Chicago. I tell everybody that uh, indirectly we all learn from the man right there, Mr. James Cotton. Sugar and... True. Yeah, we all got something from James. <laughs> 